There are two different texts that we find in the writings of the Holy Spirit that use this phrase, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. One is in 1 Timothy uh, chapter 6 and verse 15, that Jesus is the blessed and only potentate, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The other is in Revelation 19 and verse 16, that John saw that he had a name written both on his vesture and on his thigh, in two places, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So you want to see that Jesus is not a normal king. I don't know that there is such a thing as an average king, but if there is one, Jesus is not. He is a king of kings, and he's a lord of other lords. Now it's one thing to be a king of poor people and a lord of paupers. It's another thing to be a king of kings. It's another thing to be a lord of other lords, to have other kings in your ranks, but he be the king of those kings. Now there are, that's Jesus. He's the king of all other kings. There's, two, there's a couple other places in scripture that use that phrase, king of kings. Do you know what two they are? Two other men, Artaxerxes, except he called himself that. <laughs> but the other is Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel in giving the interpretation of the dream, he revealed to Nebuchadnezzar, Thou, O king, art a king of kings. See, so that was like a precursor to God was introducing the world to a, a type of ruler that ruled other rulers. Jesus is a king of kings. I like that thought. Now, this is not an honorary title. There are doctors in this world that they really didn't earn it. They were just, it was like a gift. And so they're, they're called Dr. So-and-so or Dr. That's their name. But they didn't earn it. It was just given to them. Jesus is not a king of kings only by title. He actually functions in the office as king of kings and lord of lords. That means he does his will. Even in the midst of his enemies, when he says, when he gives the word, it happens. And that centurion knew that. He said, just say the word. You don't have to come. I'm a man under authority. And so he knew how to recognize it. Just say the word and my son will be healed. And that's exactly what happened because he's king of kings. And his his word is unlike other words. So he does all of his pleasure even in the midst of enemies. I want to give you a little little overview of the things that I, that I want to say tonight. That one, Jesus is king of kings for the work that God has given him to do. God didn't, God doesn't, see, God doesn't do things just, just for show. In fact, a lot of times God hides. You, you, if you crossed Israel in the, in the wilderness and saw the tabernacle, you didn't, you, you had no indication by what it looked like what was actually in there because God hid it. See, so God, put him in this office of King of Kings and Lord of Lords because he was going to give him a work to do that he had to be King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And Jesus didn't eliminate all competition. I suppose he could have. Jesus didn't have trouble with the forces that trouble us. He didn't have trouble with evil forces even when he was humble in his humbled state. To say nothing of being in his exalted state, So with just a word, he could just eliminate all competition and we just walk our way straight to glory, right? But he didn't, and there's a reason for it. He's a king of kings and lord of lords. I like to see not only what the Lord does, but why he did it. And there's a reason why he left. See, he saved you and then left you in the same body that you were in. Why did he do that? Well, he's king of kings and lord of lords, and he's going to work you through it. See, that's, there's design in that. Here's another point that I want to uh, address tonight, that he's, he's presently exalted, except God hasn't shown it yet. So it's not obvious. See, it had to be revealed to you that he is the king of kings and lord of lords. When Stephen looked up and saw Jesus at the right hand of God, he was the only one that saw him at the right hand of God because it hadn't been shown yet. And lastly, 
One of the reasons for, Je- for the Lord arranging all of these things just as they are is because salvation is not a demonstration of power. Not primarily. It does, God does exert His power. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. But when it comes down to the essence of what God is doing in salvation, He didn't have to do all of that to show His power. He showed His power in the creation. In Christ, He's showing His wisdom and His grace. And so how, how is the Lord going to do this? Well, He's going to do it in a realm of competition. He's going to do it in a realm of, of strife. He's going to do it in, in people, in vessels where there's, where there's competition. When I will to do good, I find evil is present with me, and the Lord of Lords is going to sort it out. The King of Kings is going to work it out, and He's going to complete it all. He said when He was in this world, I always do those things that please the Father. And on the Day of Judgment, He's going to, do, he's going to say, look, I have done all things that you've commanded me to do. And he's going to hand the kingdom back over to God, and the result is going to be the wisdom of God displayed in such a way that it has never been seen before. The grace of God is going to be on display. It is now. It is now for those who can see it, but then it's going to be shown to everyone, and it's going to be, it's going to be the uh, exemplary, exemplary work of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So a king, the King of Kings is doing a work that no one else can do. Jesus doesn't do common things. He's doing a work that is, that is becoming of not only a king, but a king of other kings and a lord of other lords. See, it's one thing to, to, to be the leader of a bunch of people that are smarter, that are, that are uh, dumber than you. It's quite another thing to be a leader among leaders. You see, Jesus is a lord among lords. He's a king of all other kings, both, both friend and foe. There's a lot of good things to see here. Jesus is a king that does a kingly work. Now, the work that Jesus did in the earth was a work that had to be done in the earth. But as soon as it was done, he went back to heaven. Now, Jesus said, this is very commonly quoted, Jesus said, it is finished, and he went back to heaven, but... His work on earth was finished. Jesus is just as busy today, maybe more than he was when he was in this world. Amen. He sat down at the right hand of God. The right hand of God is, is, is the, it's the hand of God that works. It's the hand of God that's, that, that, that's busy, that's always engaged, that's doing, that's doing things, that's showing, uh, doing all of the will of God, the purpose of God, and the pleasure of God. And so he went, the work that Jesus is doing now is greater than the work that he did in the world. Just think about it like this way. Jesus, uh, he, he uh, multiplied the bread and fed 5,000 one time and multiplied it and fed 4,000 another time. Just think of the million, of million souls that he's fed now that he's been exalted at the right hand of God. When he walked in the streets of Jerusalem, he healed a lame man and he walked down the street. But now he's making people walk in the spirit. When he, he healed the, the eyes of a man that was born blind, but now he's opening the eyes of the heart. This is why Jesus said it's expedient for you that I go away, because he's doing a greater work now than he did then. Yes. See, it's the work of a king of kings and lord of lords. That how can what a word that must have been to the disciples. They were they were distraught about some of the things that Jesus had said to them. And he when he said, I, I go away, I go to the Father, and they were troubled by that. And Jesus told him, it's better for you that I go away. Well, see, he's, he's opened that up now. And Peter, well, he saw it on the day of Pentecost. He said, he has shed forth this, which you see and hear. That was, a, that was like Jesus' first kingly act. He poured out, poured out repentance, and 3,000 uh, were brought, uh, were brought into, the, into the fold that day. <clears throat> his present work on earth, his present work in earth, is greater than the work that he did when he was in the earth himself. He said uh, he is now presently bringing many sons to glory. He's bringing them through the earth. Now he ever lives to make intercession for them at the right hand of God. He is now being the head. He is giving nourishment through the body. And it comes by every joint and by every band. And he is the good shepherd. The good shepherd is not... Uh, he doesn't like pass out maps. See, he's he's the good shepherd, as in follow me, and we're going we're going with him. 
So he's leading us in and out. He's doing the work of a king. He's leading us through troubled waters, and God is, God is being uh, glorified by this. So he's, he's able to save to the uttermost now. See, the, the, wor- the work that Jesus is doing now is much greater than the work that he did when he was in the earth. Now, I don't mean to minimize. You understand this. I guess I should do some house cleaning. Paul did some of that. You know, he would, he'd be trotting through the truth and, and opening these things up, and Paul would stop and do some house cleaning. He would say things like this. Now, some of you have said, well, let us sin, that grace may abound. If grace comes where sin is, then we should sin more, that more grace should come, right? And so Paul did a little bit of house cleaning. So I'm not minimizing the work that Jesus did on the earth. I'm maximizing the work he's doing today. He's doing the work he did in the earth is what had to be done in the earth. He came and did it, completed it. That was like laying the foundation. Now he's building the house. Amen. It's at the right hand of God. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 4. For just a moment, because this is the church growth program. I know there's a lot of variations of them out in the world today, but they're they're all uh, they're all knockoffs. They're not the true thing. Jesus ascended up on high, verse eight, Ephesians four, verse eight. When he saith, he ascended up on high. He led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now, what kind of gifts did he give, and who did he give them to? Well, he gave gifts for, tells us later in the verse, for edification. And so when Jesus gives, you have edification. That's how you know that Jesus gave it. It's when there's edification. And he gives it to the church. All of these gifts that he gave were gifts to the church. That's what he gave. That's what he did when he ascended up on high. As King of kings and Lord of lords, what is going to be the kingly operation of Jesus? Giving gifts unto men. That's what he's doing. For the edification and the building up of the body. Verse 11, he gave some apostles, some pastors, some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Verse 12, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. He goes on in the text to indicate that every member has a critical role in the nourishment that comes from the head, but it's ultimately the work of the head that he's doing through the whole body. And so when Brother Mike ministers, he, he, he gives the nourishment that, that he got, and it, and it goes through that member. And, and as you, you hear it, then when, when you receive it, ultimately it's from the head, but when you receive it, you're qualified then to pass it on. And that's how the body of Christ works. That's how the kingdom works. When, when, you, when you've received it, that, that's your credential to minister it. To someone else. See, but this is this is the work of a king. This present work. He's building us together to be a holy temple in the Lord. David knew that a structure that was made by hands was not going to contain the God of heaven. He thought the heaven of heavens can't contain thee, much less this house which we have built. But the, but the house that Jesus is building as king of kings and lord of lords is going to be suitable for the God of heaven. It's going to be commodious for God to move into. God's going to feel comfortable in his people. He can move in and he can God. If we could say it this way, God can actually he can express himself in this temple when Jesus is done with it in ways that he couldn't before. The angels are seeing things about God that they'd never seen before because of the church, because of the work that the king is doing in the church. It's been called a college for angels. Have you heard that? So he's preparing his own bride. That's another way of saying the, the work that he's doing now is he's, he's preparing his own bride. He's doing what, other, what another king couldn't do. He's doing what another lord couldn't do. He's doing what it, only a king of kings could do this. Only a lord of lords could do this. See, the work that Jesus... The men are big on the start. You know this. Men are big on starting things. Even if you don't finish it, but we get, you know, we get the, the, uh, the pride out of starting. It's not about finishing, see, but the Lord's about finishing. He is the author and finisher of our faith. And so he authors faith. See, there's a lot of weird thinking about where faith comes from. Faith comes from Jesus. He's the author 
of faith. If you have the evidence of things unseen, the substance of things hoped for, and the evidence of things unseen, it's because Jesus authored it in you. It's His creation. He gave it to you. He put it in you. He's the author, but now He's the finisher. Now you know that finishing is a much greater work than just starting. Men count numbers at the start. God counts them at the end. See, what's at the, how the thing ends up is how it's judged, not how it starts. That's why Paul was so concerned about the Galatians. He wrote, he said, you did run well. What did hinder you? But people today might say, well, at least they started good. See, there's all kinds of phrases that go on, you know, uh, repentance with tears. You know, see, and what they mean by that is they had, they had a good start. Even, they're not running very good at all now, but at least they had a good start. But Jesus is finishing. He's the author and the finisher. That's why Jude wrote his letter. Because it wasn't the finish for those people that Jude wrote to. The finish wasn't looking real good. And so he wrote to them to earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. Because Jude knew that finishing was the point. If you start but don't finish. What is a prof- what is a gain? What is a profit a man if he if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? See, it takes a king to finish. It takes a lord of lords to finish faith. See, it's one thing for Moses to receive, or Abraham, to receive the promise, I'm going to bless the whole world in you. But now several years go by, and no more, no, no further word has come. And then another word comes, uh, in your seed, the, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So he's not going to bless the world uh, Uh, particularly as a prophet, he's going to bless the world as a progenitor. In your seed, I'm going to bless the whole world. And you know the account of God's dealing with Abraham, that it was was revealed little bit by little bit, kind of like Israel took the land of Canaan. They took it little bit by little bit. And so the Lord, he opened it up to Abraham, kind of like, you know, remember when Jesus said, I have many things to say to you now, but you can't bear them now. Maybe when Abraham was about 75 years old, he couldn't bear the whole thing then. And so the Lord, he started it for sure, but now he's going to finish it. And so he opens it up a little more. No, it's, it's not, it's not going to be the steward in your house. And no, it's not going to be Ishmael, even though he was born of you. And no, it's going to be born, he's going to be born of your body and he's going to be born of Sarah. See, he's getting closer to finishing because the Lord is all about finishing. He's the author and finisher. Of our faith. That's why the writer to the Hebrews was so concerned about them going on to perfection because Jesus is finishing, not just starting. And when something gets in the way from the beginning and hinders people, then the right, the, the Spirit knows, Paul knew when he addressed these people that something else had happened. There's some other influence that had, that had entered in. There was maybe some bad seed sown. Now there's, now there's, uh, uh, more than just the wheat growing up. Now maybe there's some thorns growing up with the uh, with the seed, and and the master didn't plant bad seed in his field. The Lord is the author and the finisher of our of our faith. So when he finishes, see, as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, he finishes the project. He's going to stand before God and say, in fulfillment of the prophets, "Behold, I and the children which Thou hast given me," and he's going to say, "I've I've lost none." And he's going to hand, he's going to present the, the, uh, the, the whole project. He's going to present it back to God. It's going to be perfectly completed. It's going to be exactly what God had purposed before the world ever was. When it was, when it was a God in the beginning and the Word was God and the Word was with God and they purposed this, when Jesus says, Behold, I and the children whom thou hast given me, it's going to be the perfected work of a king. The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Amen. So God has given Jesus a work to do that He had to have an exalted, exalted position, supreme authority and power in order to accomplish. But then for this issue that if Jesus is King of Kings and Lord of Lords, then why is it so hard to convince people? It's because God hadn't showed it yet. That's exactly what Paul said when he wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6.15 that I read to you at the beginning. It says, which in his time he will show. He is going to show him, but he hasn't shown him yet. 
And so, see, there's some, there, there's some details to, to dig out of that. See, the Lord sent, it, it wasn't just a matter of getting corn when, when He sent Israel and the 70 down, down to Egypt. There was a long-term plan that was, that was playing out, you know, in that, in that travel. Israel didn't know the extent of it. But see, the Lord, He's got, He sees the end from the beginning. The Lord created time. He, he's not constrained by time. And so, he, he's just not, it's just, it's just not the right time yet for Jesus to be shown. But he, nonetheless, he is the blessed and only potentate. Amen. Now the existence or the presence of enemies doesn't mean that Jesus is being challenged by those enemies. It's just that he hasn't been shown yet. In this way, God has required men to believe what he said about Jesus. We're shut up unto faith. This is exactly what Paul said. Salvation is an economy of faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please Him. But with faith, see, the Lord, the Lord can, can work in you with faith. This is, the, this is the, uh, the catalyst of God engaging with men, is faith. And so he has, He's shut up everyone to believing what He has said about Jesus. See, so Jesus isn't the first treasure that God's ever hid. He hid the that hidden manna and the gold, the rod that uh, the golden rod and the tables of the covenant. He hid them in the tabernacle, and they never did see it. See, that was like a, that was like just a little indication of uh, of this reality that God likes to hide things. Well, hasn't He hidden you in Christ? And that's one of the reasons why you've been preserved. It doth not yet appear what we shall be. Have you ever connected those two texts? That we are hidden in Christ, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. Now, just a short confession here, and this may be true of a lot of you, if not all of you. I used to think that when John said that it does not yet appear what we shall be, that John didn't know what he was going to be. It does not yet appear. I don't know. I know it's going to be good. I just don't know anything about it. That's, John wasn't confessing ignorance. John knew. He went on to say, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. He was saying, it doesn't appear to everyone else what I shall be. See, because we're hidden with Christ in God. And it's for good reason. Just imagine if, see, God has marked his people, but only he can see it. We're hid with Christ. Your lives are hid with Christ in God. And so Jesus is not apparent. It's not obvious. But in heaven it is. God's commanded all the angels, all the all the angels of God to worship him. And it's also obvious among the devil and his cohorts. You know, when he was walking in the earth, men were arguing about who he was, and the devils were begging for mercy. Why? Because they knew. They knew who he was. Art thou come to, to torment us before the time? We know thee who thou art. And they commanded him. He commanded them to be quiet. Well, what better, you know, someone might think if they'd gone to, gone to school for business marketing, they might have thought this is a great opportunity. Because men surely will believe if, de- if the devils say it about him. But that was just, that was the wrong source. That would have been like a jewel in a swine's snout. And so he commanded them not to speak, not to tell who he was, because God hadn't shown him yet. Paul saw it. Paul knew he was king of kings and lord of lords. Stephen saw it. He knew. John saw it. He knew that he was king of kings and lord of lords, but not everyone else knew it. And you won't be able to convince just everybody or anyone who you want you can't just convince anyone that he is king of kings and lord of lords because he hasn't shown it yet. We're shut up unto faith. This is one way how God reserves the, his own glory for himself. You've got to believe what I say. And you know there's a lot of weird things said about that too. People say, well, it's not enough to believe. <laughs> well, God said, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. And then men say, it's not enough to believe. Well, whose side are you going to take? God shut us up to believing. And he's hid. So he had, he is able to subdue all things to himself. But it hadn't been shown yet. Angels and authorities and powers are being made subject unto him. It just hadn't been shown yet. That doesn't make it less true. It's just God hasn't shown it. Now here's the, here, here's one place that the rubber meets the road. If Jesus had already appeared, the world would already be gone. 
It had to be hid for the stage to stay here for things to work out. When Jesus, Jesus, when he, by the brightness of his coming, he'll destroy the wicked one. And when he, uh, when he appears, the heavens and the earth will flee from him. This earth can't, it can't abide the presence of this King of Kings and Lord of Lords. It's being, it, in this way, brethren, if you can see it, remember Jesus a couple times he said, and if you can receive it about Elijah, if you can receive this, it's a mercy that Jesus hasn't been shown yet. Well, can you remember any time in your life where God bore along with you? Though he bear along with us. You, every one of you have been recipients, myself included, of course, of the patience of God, meaning salvation. So that's, that's cause to give thanks that Jesus wasn't revealed at that time. See, so the fact that he is King of kings and Lord of lords, but he hasn't been revealed, means that he's, maybe there's still a Saul of Tarsus out there. Untimely born. Born out of due season. See, the Lord's wisdom is... Is very good. Jesus, <clears throat> the government is on his shoulders. It just hasn't been uh, revealed yet. Now, Jesus could have. Jesus hasn't. He doesn't have trouble with enemies. You know, we we have trouble. Uh, we like like Paul confessed, we're troubled on every side, and we're uh, distressed and and cast down. There was a resolution to all those experiences, but nonetheless, the experiences were real. Paul wasn't acting like he was cast down just to make the Corinthians feel better about their own condition. Paul had been cast down. Why? Because he couldn't just command his enemies. But Jesus can. And so what, what about this question? If he's king of kings and lord of lords, then why are there still enemies? I'm glad you asked. Because I can answer. As I've already said, this... <clears throat> Enterprise of salvation is not just a struggle. It's not just a contest of power. It is a contest of grace. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. Were you not led to repentance by the goodness of God? You remember James' explanation of sin. A man is, a man is uh, enticed, um, tempted when he is drawn away. Of his own lust. This world is a stage of competition for your affection. God is not glorified by just overpowering and running over personalities in order to bring them. To, he's, he's glorified by wooing them. Like the prophet said, I will whistle for them. He calls for them. Jesus, he said, he stood up and said, if any man thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. What was that invitation but an open door to those who wanted what he was giving? If anyone thirsts, he's drawing men. Salvation is not just a contest of who's stronger, God or Satan. There is no contest of who's stronger. God, God doesn't even have to exert his own uh, his own like first hand power to put away the devil he's going to send a nameless angel to do that and it won't even be a competition there's not with all of the hype and people being scared and worried and anxious about the battle of Armageddon there is there is no competition between Jesus and the devil when it comes to power he could have put him away but he didn't now here's here's what I'm getting to <clears throat> this is good Jesus as king of kings He's actually going to use his enemy to do his work. Only a king can do that. Now, it's one thing to just have the bald power just to overcome your enemy. But that's, like, that's just like a lower grade of power. There's some forms of power in the world that all it can do is blow things up. It's powerful, but all it can do is destroy things. There's that kind of force. But Jesus... He's not struggling with the devil. He's the king of the devil. He's the prince of the power. He's the, he's the prince of life. There is no... See, we, the, the, uh, Michael the archangel durst not bring against him a railing accusation over the dispute about the body of Moses. Jesus doesn't have problems with the devil. 
So here's, here's some of the particulars. I'm getting, getting ahead of myself here. The presence of the enemy doesn't mean that Jesus has lost control and is vying for the reins. The earth was made by him and for him. It's his creation. And the devil is, he, he's, he's the, he's the enemy that slipped in. He's the thief that's come in. I mean, he's just, he's just being put to the grind and being used for Jesus' own purpose. Only supreme power can use an opposing power for its own good. And that's exactly what Jesus is doing. Because he's king of kings and the Lord of lords. The, John said in his first epistle that he came to de, he destroyed the works of the devil. But then he left the devil here. Now why... Why would he, why would he do such a thing? Well, you remember, uh, the devil was the, uh, the thorn that Paul had. It was a messenger of Satan. And it taught him that Jesus' strength is made perfect in his, in his weakness. My grace is sufficient for thee. And so he concluded, although for glory in mine infirmities. So now, just for a minute, try to, uh, try to step into the, and see from the devil's perspective. Finally, a door's open. I can get to Paul. And he ministers as a probably unknowing, unwittingly, he's doing the will of Jesus, acting as a messenger, and it distresses Paul. This is what Satan's thinking. And then it turns against him. So what can Satan, what, what's Satan gonna do? What can he do? He's the, the king of kings is working all of this out. What about Job? He couldn't do anything until the Lord, you know, allowed him. Okay, you can, you can touch what he has, but don't touch him. Bam, it's all done. I mean, there's a, you know, the devil just doesn't, he doesn't struggle with time and space like men do. And he just takes it all from him. And it didn't turn out like the devil thought it was going to. And so he goes back to ask more permission. He said, okay, you can touch him, but don't take his life. He did, I I just have a feeling that the devil did, he took every inch he could possibly take that the Lord allowed him to. And it still didn't turn out like the devil thought. His ways are being frustrated. See, the, work, the works of the devil have been, have been destroyed, and I'll prove it to you. When was the last time you resisted the devil and he, fleed from, he fled from you? That's evidence that the works of the devil have been destroyed. When was the last time, and I know the answer, <clears throat> when was the last time your shield of faith failed you and it didn't quench the fiery dart? It quenches all the fiery darts of the wicked. See, that's another evidence that the works of the devil have been destroyed, but he's been kept, he's been allowed on a leash to stay in the world where we are. And the Lord has, the the Lord works with this uh, by design. We have been warned in the Revelation, woe unto the inhabitants of the earth, for the devil has come down unto you full of wrath, knowing that is, that he hath but a short time. Well, I figured if his time is short, then ours is probably shorter, right? But he's come down and he can only do, like in the days of Job, what the Lord allows him to do because he's king of kings and the Lord of lords. He does, he turns us, as Paul said, he turns us from the power of Satan. But then we stay within his reach. And it's by design. Because the devil, actually, whom used to take us at his will. You remember those days? We're taken captive by him at his will. And now that we've been, we've been delivered, been redeemed, walking in the light, now the devil is, not, the Lord is turning the devil's efforts that used to ensnare you, he's turning those very same efforts into perfecting you. Only a king can do that. It takes a Lord of lords to do that. See, in the earthly, in the earthly realms, it's much more much more preferable just to take out the opposing power and just to be done with it. But the Lord hasn't done that. He's left the opposing power uh, in, and he, he uses it. <clears throat> See, even the Lord, he said um, that, that one occasion where he said, you give them something to eat. And then the Holy Spirit says, well, he said this to prove them. He knew what he was going to do. But he kind of laid the card on the table to see who might pick it up. He said this, he said this to prove them. And that he uses the, the, uh, the activity and the wrath of the wicked one also to, to prove us. As he did with the, the thorn in the flesh. There are some things in our progress to glory that 
it's much, it's better. The Lord has deemed in himself. It's better that the enemy facilitate this part of the progress rather than a friend. See, this is not, we, we can't write uh, laws and, and, and rules about these kind of things. This is the Lord's prerogative. He giveth the increase. But there are some things, I just, just, just hear me out on this. There are some things that the Lord is going to use the devil to perfect something in you or work something out of you rather than a friend. There are other things that the Lord's going to use the brethren to do and not the devil. See, there's a certain there's a certain kind of work. See, it's a it's a complicated saving saving men is a complicated endeavor, and he's going to use friend and foe in in doing in doing this work. I, I praise the Lord for that. <clears throat> How he would. <clears throat> so we're we're also um, given this injunction to put off put off the old man uh, with with his deeds and put on. Uh, the new man put off the the works of darkness and to put on uh, the the armor of light and see the more the more the enemy heckles you about it don't you you just get more and more averse to the old man I mean when did when was the last time the old man did you a favor you see that just it, it just moves you a little bit further away from the ways of the world and gives you a little a little better taste for the heavenly places you know if you walk in the spirit. You will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Amen. See, so it's actually a mercy. You can't just you, you can't say this just to anyone, but I'll say it to you. It's actually, in a way, it's a mercy that there are still enemies in the world. Now, don't don't put in more into that than what I've said. You you see how how that could be taken the wrong way. But the Lord is doing an advantageous work with the enemy, and I dare say only the Lord could do it. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Now lastly, the Lord is not just flexing heavenly muscles, as it were, in working out salvation in the midst of the earth. He is showing, according to uh, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 7, He is, he's investing in such a way in salvation that in the world to come, in the ages to come, he calls it in verse seven, that he's show the exceeding riches of his grace. And so he's building an index. He's building a a trophy of grace. So when it's, when it's all done, his grace is going to be on display in the church. It's going to be a work of grace that hasn't been seen before. Just like His eternal power and Godhead is seen in the creation of this world, His grace is creating the new creature and, and, and the church when it's joined to Christ. Ephesians 3 and verse 10, it's like Paul got done with chapter 2 of Ephesians and he thought, boy, that was good. So he started up chapter 3 and he said, you know, more than grace, he's also showing in verse 10 of Ephesians 3, he's showing the manifold wisdom of God by the church. And so we might say it this way, that sal- salvation is not just a struggle of power. It's not just a demonstration of overt power. It is a demonstration of wise power. And there's a difference. It's not just strong force. It's wise force. Now, you know from your own experience of living in this world and being in this body that if salvation was just, was, was just a matter of, of strength and forces that we might, not, we might not be able to endure it. But the Lord is mindful. He's, a, he's pitiful and of tender mercies. And so he, he is, by wise power, he is demonstrating in the church. Now, I guess the Lord could have, as soon as you believe, just taken you out of the world. People just dying. Well, another one believed. They're gone. Well, of course, the ones left wouldn't be able to diagnose it. But I guess, I guess the Lord could have done that. Just the, the moment that a person's justified, he just takes them out of the world. Except they, they wouldn't be as usable in the world to come if he had done it that way. I dare, I dare to guess that you, whether you've walked in the Lord 55 years, 5 years, or 5 days, you know more today than you did in the past. The Lord can give you more than what he used to give you. That's because he left you in the body. 
But we're not immune to the presence of evil and to the presence of darkness. If Paul was, if Paul was sub- subjected to distress, then which one of us would dare to imagine that we will be immune to it? His strength is made perfect in weakness. <clears throat> we are also not quarantined from temptation. The temptation is... Now, here, here's your goal in temptation. This is just a little, little digression. Jesus suffered being tempted. Am I right? Here's, what, here's where you want to reach in your walk of faith. You want temptation to hurt. Jesus suffered when He was tempted. And when you're heart of heart... And when you've drifted from the Lord, temptation doesn't hurt like it should. The Lord hasn't exempted us from temptation because He's still still drawing us. He's actually using the temptation in order to perfect us. I love the words of the prophets when He said, I will thoroughly purge away all thy tin. You know what tin is? It's a mixture. It's impure. And it's and it has a weaker constitution because it's all and so he's he's going to take take away the tin and when the heat when the heat turns up what comes up first dross so he hasn't made us immune to temptation because in in the resisting in the standing stand in the evil day in the standing things are going to come out of you that otherwise wouldn't have come out but it takes a king of kings to manage that. It takes a Lord of Lords to handle that. I sure am glad. And I love Brother Tony, but I'm glad the Lord didn't put Brother Tony in charge of my temptations. Because he will not allow me to be tempted above what I'm able to bear. And I dare say that I don't know what I'm able to bear to say nothing of Brother Tony knowing what I'm able to bear. I'll tell you how it would turn out if the Lord put each one of us in charge of our own temptations then we would, you know how that would go. I can only bear about this much. But see, when, you, when, you're, when you're tempted to think, I'm not going to be able to bear this, just remember, He will not allow you to be tempted above that you are able to bear. He is faithful. And will, with the temptation, also give you a way of escape. So what the Lord is doing is by His grace, He's teaching us to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts and live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. And so let's step back just, just a half a step and look at what this looks like. Satan looking into the places of the world and he sees the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He's got full sway over these places, over the earthly places. He can't do anything without going and asking permission. And when, he, when the devil's looking into these earthly places, he's seeing these creatures that are redeemed who used to be under his sway. Now they're being drawn to the Lord. And now it's, it's, it's not that they're being drugged unconsciously. It's that they are actually laboring together with him. They are. Just imagine what it looks like to the wicked forces when they see... They're, they're striving to take hold of the same thing for which Jesus took hold on them. Laboring together with God. See, grace teaches, I like to say it this way. Grace is not a blackboard teacher. Grace is not a lecturer. Grace teaches you in, in real life. Grace teaches you in experience. Grace teaches you by what, by what you taste, by what you smell. By what you see, by what you feel, grace is a good teacher. Grace can grace teaches us, brethren, what we can't teach each other. There are things that we that we teach each other, but where where our teaching runs out, grace picks up. Grace is teaching us that denying ungodliness. So the Lord is rescuing people from right under the hand of the enemy, and He's turned the enemy's activities that were against them actually to their advantage, if you can see it. And you need to see it because only a king of kings could do that. And a lord of lords. So I'll leave you with this thought concerning these things as a, I trust, a fitting conclusion. And this was a conclusion that Paul made and left his, um, the brethren that he wrote to in the book of Romans. <clears throat> the God of all peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. A king of kings and lord of lords. Only he could take the subjects, rescue them, set their feet on a rock, put a new song in their mouth, even praise to God, and then end up destroying the enemy with those 
whom he rescued from the enemy. I say all praise goes to the Lord. Amen.